Yeah, every time somebody promises that somehow you know running the printing press a little bit faster will somehow get us to the other side, they're always wrong. Now, you also said something that's pretty inflammatory, and I want to talk about it because you said that on a gold standard, central banks are really not necessary. Now, under the classical gold standard system, some of the countries involved in that system back in the 19th century did have central banks, but the role of those central banks was severely circumscribed. Basically, they were there to help regulate the system, in particular, to help wind down banks that got into trouble through excessive debt and leverage. Okay. And the Bank of England in particular was active in that regard. In fact, it was so active that the Bank of England was under constant criticism that it was too willing to bail out banks that got in trouble and that it should actually be a hell of a lot tougher. And Walter Bajhat, a very famous uh, UK economic journalist uh, during the mid 19th century, famously said that the only legitimate role for a central bank in a healthy capitalist economy is to lend freely, but at penalty rates of interest against good collateral. Nowadays, the Fed and other central banks, every time anyone gets in trouble or a crisis comes around, oh sure, they lend freely, but not at penalty rates of interest, maybe zero, zero. instead, and against, and against any collateral. Central banks are buying everything. They're buying mortgages, they're buying corporate debt, they're buying junk debt, they're buying equities, they're buying anything they can get their hands on. This goes so far from the original mandate that central banks had under the gold standard. It's like night and day. And as I do argue in my book, you can easily make a case that under a gold standard, you can simply allow the market itself, banks themselves, that is commercial banks, to set interest rates in a free market and banking can begin to look like an ordinary industry, one that actually competes, one that has to set prices for itself and with customers, one in which when a firm gets in trouble, it, it's either taken over by competitors or it goes bankrupt. That is an industry that has to produce the services it produces at a price that people can reasonably afford and are willing to pay. And if it can't do that, tough, it's going to suffer. Profits will decline, and executives will not receive outsized bonuses for substandard performance. Banking would look like that again if we went back onto a gold standard. So right now people are looking at the spot markets and they see silver at like somewhere a little bit north of 24 bucks an ounce and they see gold at somewhere north of at the moment maybe 1800 give or take an ounce. Um, can we trust that what we're looking at is the real value or when we go back on the, in, as you say, inevitable, and I agree with that a hundred bazillion percent, when we do go back to that gold standard, what can we expect in, in nominal terms? Because I know I don't really think about it like that, but most people do. Yes. Uh, I mean, look, there are ways to approach this. Uh, I, I do so in my book. Mm -hmm. uh, many of your viewers may be, uh, may be familiar with Jim Rickards. He mm -hmm. does so in his book. Yes, he's the been first on the, Yeah, the, the first economist that I know of who directly attacked this problem of estimating the market clearing price of gold in the event that the United States and other countries choose to remonetize it were uh, Murray Rothbard and Harry Brown. Back in the 70s, both of them went through the calculation uh, metrics for how to estimate the market clearing gold price in the event gold is remonetized. And basically what you do is this, you basically come up with some sort of estimate for to what extent bank deposits would need to be backed by gold to make such a system viable, uh, credible. And one simple way to do that is just to say, hey, let's go back to the way things worked under Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods was not a 100% reserve system. It was still a fractionally reserved system. However, it was fractionally reserved in a way that the world, at least for the first couple decades of Bretton Woods, considered as credible. 
So let's use that as a benchmark. And basically what that means is that you need to have a meaningful portion of the U.S. money supply backed by U.S. gold reserves. And then, of course, you extend that to other countries. Their respected money supplies need to be, to some extent, backed by, by their gold reserves and so on. And under Bretton Woods, the, the round number uh, that was used there was 40%. That is, you've got to be able to back 40% of your narrow, and I stress narrow, money supply uh, with gold reserves. That is M1. Uh, actual demand deposits, actual cash and circulation would need to be 40% backed by gold. That said, if you want to remonetize gold today in a way that is not disruptive, you might need to back 40% of M2, which extends into time deposits and certain other forms of money substitutes. And the reason I say that is because those forms of money substitutes that comprise M2 today are so central to the fundamental stability of the financial system, that if you don't allow M2 to be meaningfully backed by gold reserves, it might not be seen as a credible system. It will bring down too many of the banks, too much of the financial system will crumble. Well, so many people say, well, but can't they just keep printing the money? Can't this just keep going on forever? What do you say to that? Well, look, I mean, look, if, if, if it were that easy, <laughs> if it were really that easy, don't you think we would have arrived at nirvana by now? I mean, yeah, every time somebody promises that somehow you know, running the printing press a little bit faster will somehow get us to the other side, they're always wrong. Always. I mean, please, find me one exception. I would love to believe in, in the magic money tree, as some people call it. Uh, but those of us who are inclined towards reason and logic, you know, find that extremely difficult to accept, given the lessons of history and the fact that theoretically it just doesn't make sense. So it may be fashionable, of course, to justify your present policy proclivities uh, with fashionable monetary theories that make all kinds of sense in ivory tower academic la la land uh, but these, <laughs> yeah. these theories in i mean they just invariably fail when they make contact with the real world the system actually died and just went on life support right and so oh, it's, a, it's a good <laughs> metaphor for sure <laughs> that is and do you have any comments about that and and what they've been doing since because i think you and i both agree that this quantitative easing, all this money printing, it didn't solve the issues that arose in 2008 or became apparent to the globe. That, that's a much better way to put it. Well, it, it certainly did not solve them. I mean, it, it bought time. And, and in principle, if you buy time, you can do something intelligent and constructive with that time. But that isn't what's happened. Um, you know, they, 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 they bought time, but as you say, you know, the patient was put on life support and they haven't really taken any meaningful actions that will resuscitate the patient in a sustainable way. That has not happened. And indeed, I would argue, um, as someone who has studied uh, so-called Austrian economics mm -hmm. in, in depth, that what has happened is in fact a continuation of some fundamental, if difficult to see, resource misallocations that are yes. distorting the capital stock, moving moving productive capital into places where it's completely unproductive. And therefore we're not really continuing to build the productive resource base that we need to provide for our own retirements, for our children's futures, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, to summarize, we're making a bad situation worse.